When I say the word manga, what's likely to come to your mind is a collection of chapters, sometimes in the hundreds, that tells an overarching narrative that can be consumed weekly, monthly, or binged after its completion. Or at least, that would be the case if you hadn't clicked on a video that is clearly centered around one-shots. The fact that I have it plastered both on the title and thumbnail kind of defeats the purpose of my otherwise cleverly framed introduction, but for the uninitiated, are those simply willing to humor me? A one-shot is a self-contained story told using the same sequential art style that your typical manga series uses. It's a significantly less popular, talked about younger sibling of manga discussion, but it's home to some of the most touching and human stories I've ever consumed. So today, I'd like to bring attention to many of these isolated stories I've come across and discuss the art of the one-shot. a self-contained story that has good character writing, pacing, and the capability of getting you emotionally invested is a skill that is really undervalued in anime and manga spaces. Long-running manga, especially Battle Shonen and Seinen, always get the credit for being well-told stories with great characters, fights, and narrative beats, and while some of the best pieces of fiction I've ever read in the medium do come from these longer-running manga, I can say the same about one-shots. A good one-shot is able to deliver quality storytelling that is pound-for-pound pound compared to other serialized works while being significantly more succinct and compact. This not only allows for more variety for you to experience as a reader, as you don't have to commit an entire month to enjoy this one work, but it also allows for a level of focus on each page and panel that simply isn't necessary elsewhere. This self-contained storytelling style is appreciated much more in film, both long and short, and today I'd like to show a lot of that love to the medium of manga. Some of the one-shots I want to talk about today are excellent, but just like serialized manga, a one-shot can come in many different shapes shapes, sizes, and genres, but in my personal experience, I found that they come in three main categories, the prelude, the extension, and the independent. Every one shot I've ever read falls into one of these three categories and they all serve very different explicit purposes that have their own unique strengths and weaknesses. The prelude, as I like to call it, is the simplest and most common in my experience reading this manga. In a word, this kind of one shot merely acts as a pilot episode for a manga that any given author hopes to get made and published on a regular schedule. It's a proof of concept that is shown to editors and audiences alike in order to get a good grasp on what the series at large will feel and read like. Many of your favorite series have one shots that fit the description, although they could be somewhat tough to get your hands on considering their diminished popularity. In any case, I think these manga have a charm of their own, specifically when going back to read them as a fan of the series in question. Depending on which story you're talking about, the pilot of any given manga can differ very drastically from its later published work or align pretty closely to it in most aspects. Naruto and Bleach's respective pre-serialization one-shots depict both ends of this spectrum pretty well. In Bleach's case, aside from the scan quality, which looks like it survived a literal house fire, many of the elements of the plot establishing section of the story remain the same. Ichigo can still see hollows, Rukia still gives them Shinigami powers, and Kubo's interesting brand of comedy that's particularly prominent in early Bleach is on full display. By all accounts, you can tell this is a very early and rough rendition of what Bleach ended up being, but it's still obviously identifiable as the story we know it to be, with the many differences that do exist with the manga being quite noticeable. In fact, between the similarities and differences, I'd say that as a fan of what we commonly now know as Taite Kubo's flagship series, noting what he ended up changing or repurposing is the most rewarding part of reading this one shot. Ruki is Shinigami powers returning after a week, for example. This is obviously a narrative tool that allows for the story to be wrapped up more succinctly, but still contrasts what actually happens in the substitute Shinigami arc. Rather than his dad running a clinic, it's a mortuary in this story, and the big bombshell of the one-shot plot-wise is the fact that Orhime just dies. Not metaphorically, or rhetorically, or poetically, or theoretically, or any other fancy way. Orhime dies straight up. Obviously, this isn't a plot point that remains present during Bleach's serialization, but it's interesting to see how Kubo's mind works so early in his most popular work's development. Her connection to her dad is tweaked a little bit, and instead of focusing on him, focuses on her brother and his journey in becoming a hollow. But the skeleton of the familial plot beats are there and very fun to see. Contrast this with Naruto's very own pilot episode, and you find a similar appeal in reading it, although for an entirely different reason. Aside from the titular character himself, a few rough outlines of cast members we'd later see in the manga, and the theme of bonds being extremely important and worth pursuing, this version of Naruto and Naruto as it exists in the hearts and minds of the masses are entirely different pieces of art. These changes can be as small as modern technology like guns and cars being present, to 
Naruto not being a vessel for the Nine Tails, but its son, or even Chakra, Shinobi, and Jutsu as we know it not being established in the context of this universe. In the case of this manga, the value that I find in reading it comes from almost relief that Kishimoto was influenced by his editors to revise, add, and edit many of the ideas that I'm sure he wanted to put forth in his first draft of the story. It's quite fascinating to peer behind the curtains to see exactly what Kishimoto was thinking so early on in his career, but there's also a deep sense of appreciation for the fact that his series ended up the way that it did. This contrast of feelings highlights this species of one-shot's strengths and weaknesses artistically. Wow, that was a lot of fucking S's. If you're somewhat interested in writing or creating art yourself, these manga are not only encouraging to read as they show off the unrefined nature of mangaka before their big break, but they also act as almost elseworld stories for dedicated fans of the manga, just interested to see more of their favorite author's work. A sense of curiosity is satiated in a way that I only think a look into the process could. When standing on their own two feet though, Bleach's and Naruto's pre-serialization one-shot, and more generally one-shots that fall into the prelude category, tend to be a bit weaker. As I mentioned before, they have some entertainment value from the perspective of someone going back and comparing, but in isolation, these one-shots are almost always a much lesser product than what we ended up getting serialized. There's a certain roughness that many of these rookie mangaka have that gets ironed out as they get more chapters under their belt and more comfortable as authors and artists, but this roughness is very present and rears its head in an ugly way when specifically talking about the prelude category of one-shots. General themes, character art, archetypes and art styles can be established, but almost anything beyond that is sanded down to its bare essentials. It's understandable given its purpose, seeing as how these mangaka aren't aiming to tell their best story in one chapter, but its comparative lack of quality and charm dooms them to only existing in the shadow of their more well-renowned work. While they do fit the bill as a one-shot, they don't epitomize exactly what I find so fascinating about the art form. When looking for a bit more of a refined storytelling edge, the extension one-shot variety is likely to suit your needs. The extension, much like the prelude, is a one-shot type that is typically connected to an already established franchise. However, instead of coming before and acting as a pilot episode, these manga tend to add to the lore, world building, characters, or themes of any given story that an audience member may be familiar with. These one-shots are sometimes written and penned by the same people who made the mainline story, as is the case with Naruto, The World Within the Spiral, or Bleach, Howl from the Jaws of Hell. In instances like these, it's refreshing and extremely exciting to see one of your favorite manga not only return to the medium in a significant way, but return to the mythos that you love so much and only contribute more to it. The Minato one-shot added context to Minato and Kushina's relationship, the construction of the Rasengan, Kushina's ability to control the Nine Tails, and even how the spiraling nature of the Uzumaki clan ties into the overarching themes present within the one-shot and Naruto as a series. The art in this manga is fantastic, which is to be expected of Kishimoto, and as a pretty huge fan of Naruto as a franchise, and Minato as a character, I have to say that reading this was a very memorable experience. Bleach's one-shot accomplishes a similar feeling, but goes about it in a slightly different way. Rather than being a self-contained story harping on the past or simultaneously occurring plot, Kubo goes the route of showing us the future and leaving things open-ended for the Bleach hell arc that maybe he's gonna write? I, I don't even know at this point, and I feel like Kubo's playing in all of our faces, but I digress. This one shot not only adds to Bleach lore and gives us a much appreciated update on the Soul Society, but Ichigo himself and the rest of the cast that we Bleach fans have come to love so much, but it also opens the door for a plethora of more Kubo crafted goodness, which has its own air of excitement to it. Now Bleach and Naruto are good examples of the, let's say homegrown extension one shot, but they aren't the only manga to do this. Yuji Kaku created a one shot for Hell's Paradise that is rather small in narrative scope, but serves to update us on the character of Gabimaru specifically. How he's living and attempting to create an honest path for himself is facilitated through the escapades in the Forest of Misfortune, which the side story gets its name from. It mainly serves as an extension to the main character's development over the course of 127 chapters, rather than being anything that adds context to the broader story or lore at large. This approach to storytelling in one shots isn't grand or presented in a way that demands attention in the same fashion that Bleach and Naruto stories do, but I appreciate its existence just as much due to how it adheres to the arc Gabimaru was 
on so well. Tack on some pretty standard Yuji Kaku art and action sequences, and I'm honestly going to be sold altogether. Death Note A Kira kind of touches on the opposite end of this extreme. In a post-light, post-L world, there honestly isn't much character to be explored that we hadn't already seen in the main manga, nor, in my case at least, was I particularly interested in doing so. Rather than take that approach, what we get is extrapolation on how exactly the world was impacted by Kira's actions, how history looked back on him, and the escapades of Ryuk with a heavy focus on Minoru, who was the protagonist of this short manga. The writing and art style very closely aligns to the original series, actually being a noticeable step up in the visual department and that is appreciated on all fronts. This isn't my favorite example of the extension style of insulated storytelling, but it does contribute to a greater understanding of the Death Note and a post-Kira world. Demonstrating Light's impact on how Shinigami conduct business due to apples being introduced to the Shinigami community, if you can even call it that, is pretty funny. And also just goes to show, for all of his faults and delusions of grandeur, he did end up having an impact that lasted far beyond his own lifespan. The A-Kira story is actually part of a collection of Death Note related short stories called Death Note Tanpenshu, and I do recommend checking out all of the stories. This one just so happens to be the main and one that I found most interesting. In any case, it's clear that these lore, character, world building, and thematic extensions of, you know what? Hold on. Okay. Y yeah, this works. <clears throat> In any case, it's clear to see that these lore, character, world building, and thematic additions to these previously established universes has value in itself. The supplementary nature combined with the quality writing and art that is gained with experience leads to an artistic outcome that I'm left satisfied with nine times out of 10. In complete contrast to stories told before an author has really found their voice, style of drawing, and basic narrative foundations, these manga made after everything is said and done feel refined and almost purified in a way with all of the unnecessary aspects sifted through and only the best of their work shining. If this is all that this category of one shot amounted to, I would still prefer it to the one discussed before. But these side stories written and illustrated by the original author are not the only kind that exist. Oftentimes an author is too busy or simply not willing to completely get behind the wheel and add on to their universe in a manual way. Sometimes they'll pass the buck, whether it be to an artist or writer as well, which creates its own unique reading experience. The distinct appeal to this subgenre of one shot is the exploration of a familiar set of characters and world while being able to see how exactly it would look with another competent mangaka taking the reins. It's a natural thing to wonder how some of your favorite stories would look or feel if they were written by someone else, and while this doesn't entirely happen in these short stories, it does allow that fantasy to be indulged in a pretty unique way. The original ideas and broad strokes of the story will be done by the author, of course, to adhere to some consistency, but a divergence of paths is to be expected, and a great example of someone else taking the reins and transforming it into their own is the Demon Slayer Gaiden short stories focusing on both Giyu and Rengoku. In both of these manga, we get to see a different side to them. Hmm. I was just made aware that neither of these stories I was going to talk about are one shots. Both manga, in fact, have two chapters. Well, Hunter Hunter Hisoka Origin Story is a manga that focuses on, you guessed it, Hisoka's backstory written and illustrated by Sui Ishida. The fucking goat, by the way, argue with your mother. But it's honestly the perfect example of a different take for a one shot like this. Ishida's art style and approach to presentation with the medium of manga couldn't be more different from Tagashi's, so it feels like we're able to consume this manga through a lens that we shouldn't take for granted. Hisoka's character is obviously the same, or at least a proper origin point for the strength obsessed clown we see in the mainline story, but Ishida's own interpretation of the character somewhat colors how he's written. Now, the author of Tokyo Ghoul is in no way new to the idea of writing very eccentric, flamboyant, or even just straight up crazy characters, and in this instance, it feels like with Hisoka, he turns that knob up just a little bit, possibly meaning to highlight how as a boy, Hisoka might have put less of a lid on his rather unique personality. Now, let me quickly address the elephant in the room. The art is just straight up incomplete in this manga. Now, I love it. A, because I'm simply sipping the Sui Ishida Kool-Aid, and B, because despite the draft nature in which it's drawn, Ishida very rarely has panels that are indiscernible or too cluttered to read. Couple that with the interpretation that is drawn this way to signify how, we'll say, undefined Hisoka's backstory could actually be, and I love it. It's not going to be for everyone, though, so I'd figure I'd mention it given the chance. In any case, this manga provides the reader two simple pleasures. The first one that I've already made note of is offer a new take on characters that is technically on model, but colored by the tastes and preferences of whoever is penning.
getting it. The second is a simple expansion on Hisoka's past in a way that satiates curiosity for all who care about it, which is to say, I really enjoy it and the subgenre. By all accounts, the extension style of one shot is much more enjoyable than the one shots that act as origin points for any given manga, but that doesn't mean it's perfect. It still doesn't quite reach the epitome of what I'm talking about. For all of its refinement and additive properties, I don't think it perfectly embodies the concept of the one shot, at least not quite to the degree that this final category does. The characters, themes, and world can all be fleshed out further and even lead to a completely self-contained story However, that is only under the pretense of you knowing about these things beforehand. Unlike what I find to be the peak of the art form, this kind of one shot almost always requires foreknowledge to consume. Not an issue if you're already a fan of the story, but definitely a barrier to entry when they're follow ups or side content for full blown manga series. If you want a true, completely self contained experience with no extra context or knowledge needed, a true movie that unfolds on the page, the individual is the one-shot type you're looking for. Daisuki Nasuma Data, or if you speak English and take showers regularly, My Wife Whom I Love Dearly, is a one-shot that in a short 33 pages tells a very emotional and compelling story. This manga is shorter than many other one-shots of its ilk, and yet every time I think of it, I still find myself getting teary-eyed. A big contributor to this feeling is the art style. It feels soft, almost, innocent in nature, at least when it's trying to be. Now I'm dancing around the plot of this one shot for one simple reason. I think everyone watching this video should read it and experience it firsthand. Not only is it simply a good and brief read, but the context you read it in changes after experiencing it just once. If you're someone who wants the pure read, you can pause this video, take 10 minutes to go read it, and come right back. For the small handful of people who have already read this manga, and the crowd that will inevitably not heed my warning, I'll just say this. If you've lost a loved one, whether it be a parent, a sibling, or a partner, there is something about this story that hits you in the chest hard. The story follows the perspective of a husband who is losing his wife to cancer and seeing how the approach of death has changed his wife's love for him sour. For two thirds of this manga, you were led to believe that Chika is merely unleashing all of her pent up distress onto her husband with no regard for how he feels. For two thirds of this manga, the husband grapples with the guilt of loving his wife, yet paradoxically wanting her to die so that he's able to free himself from this burden. For two thirds of this manga, you are fed a lie. In reality, she could never stop loving her husband. She had merely been trying to relinquish him from his suffering by getting him to hate her so much that when she died, he wouldn't be sad. The realization is both a relief and punch to the gut that knocks the wind out of you and Takahashi alike. Seeing them reconcile is heartwarming. Seeing them cry together is sad, and to see both of their sacrifices mean nothing in the end is gut-wrenching. Takahashi has felt guilt for six months that came from resentment from his wife that he shouldn't have. Chika burdened him with this hate in order to later release him, only for their final days to be spent loving each other as they had before, erasing six months of work. When she passes, I was left confused, searching for what exactly it was that this story was trying to say. Was everything before the final 11 pages pointless? Chika still died in the end, and Takahashi, despite her efforts, is left mourning. But it's when reading the last page that I understood. The point was never lost. Their efforts were the point, not the outcome. Chika and Takahashi never changed. Their love for each other never faded. And despite the pain that comes with losing the person who you loved and who loved you, knowing for certain that they felt the same way, well, it seemed to be enough for Takahashi. He doesn't pick a picture for the ceremony that glorifies the past or highlights how much they loved each other before the cancer, before the hard times. He takes a picture of both of them crying. Chika sickly and pouting and proudly proclaims that this is them as they truly were. Fuck, that's good, man. I got all this, all this emotion, all this, passion, all this quality, and 33 pages. There was no backstory needed, no prior connection to the author, no prior connection to an established universe, just 33 pages of emotional and quality writing delivered with an art style that feels like a good memory. Now, if it sounds like I'm on the verge of tears right now, I probably am. Oh yeah. 
By the way, if you didn't read the story yet and listen to me talk about it anyway, on your soul, you'll develop a cough in three days. Anyway, speaking of tears, I'm not sure why, but many of the one shots I've read always lean into a sad, melancholic or bittersweet tone. Maybe that's just selection bias on my part. In fact, I'm sure it's selection bias on my part, but it's definitely a trend I have picked up on. Love Letter by Ozaki Kaori is a great example of this. Now, I actually didn't realize this until making this video, but she's actually an author that's made quite a few manga that I like. The Golden Sheep and the God's Lie are my favorite works from her, and those as well are pretty brief despite not being one shots. Now, if I had known that going into this, I probably would have been more prepared for what Love Letter ended up being, but unfortunately, my heart and tear ducts we're not ready. I'll keep this one brief because there's another one shot I'd really like to go into depth with, so for simplicity's sake, I'll say this. The plot essentially follows one soul and one girl. The soul is able to choose its mother in heaven and chooses Unoma Asaka, a 17-year-old girl that doesn't have the ability to care for a kid. Despite this fact, the soul is dead set on having Asaka as his mom. He appreciates her as a mom despite all the hardships they face together, but eventually dies due to neglect. Now this death, while tragic in concept, is actually played a little whimsically because the soul is just brought back to heaven in front of God. They have no regret with their choice and dedicate themselves to incarnating over and over again to be by her side. A cat a flower, a cloud, a song, even a breeze. This soul will do anything to be beside Asaka, the one they find so beautiful. The guilt that she feels, however, is hard to watch. And while this soul's efforts are far from pointless, there is a wistful nature to how they show up, even becoming a raindrop to whisper a simple assurance of the woman who was once their mother. Don't cry, mom. Damn. Mm -mm. The love that was lost and the love that was gained both of these things battle in the heart, but in the end, we punctuate this chapter with a simple tale of the soul and his mother showing their love for each other. Another beautiful story told in a short 56 pages. The power of the one shot winning out again. Now, I've named two one shots that I've read recently that stand out to me. But don't be mistaken, there are plenty of one shots in the world that I don't have the same emotional connection to that are also really good. I've mentioned this plenty of times in the video, but a good one shot is like a good short film. When done correctly, you get really high quality storytelling that can be as or more interesting than long running manga with a fraction of the time spent and prerequisites to enjoy it. You can consume so many different perspectives from so many different artists and authors this way, and I honestly recommend a a one shot binge if you're ever looking to just become more in tune with manga as a medium. Outside a few pretty specific contexts, it's what I've been doing and I'm very much enjoying it. An added benefit to these self-contained stories is that they can be released more regularly than long works. So that gives people like you or I the ability to experience a particular author's work in numerous different scenarios and situations. How do they write under time constraints? How do they go about illustrating a character with certain personality traits? How have they evolved over the course of their manga career? How have they remained the same? Questions like these are really fun to ask, and outside of interviews, one shots are the best way to peer into the mind of any particular artist, as art is a vehicle to understand the one who made it. The example of this in my mind is Tatsuki Fujimoto. I mean, let's be real here. There's no way I can make a video about one shots without mentioning him, and that's for good reason. This guy has made a lot of manga, and for the same reason a film bro might go watch a bunch of Tarantino movies, or Jordan Peele movies, or some other third guy, I just like going through Fujimoto's oeuvre. He released two books containing a collection of some of these short stories he's written, and man, do you really get what you paid for with these. I recommend picking these two up if you haven't, because this collection is just what I've been talking about for a large part of this video, but I think it's time. I've been dancing around it for long enough. There are two stories that moved me so much that I felt obligated to make this video, and Tatsuki Fujimoto is the cause of this. Goodbye, Airy and Look Back respectively are possibly the best one shots I've ever read and two manga that I find to be even better than Chainsaw Man and Fire Punch, his most popular and lengthy works. Now I know that's a hot take, but let me land. Now, the question really is where to even start. These two manga, as far as I'm concerned, are Fujimoto's best works. With both manga sitting at a combined page kind of around 350 pages, there really isn't that much raw material when compared to Fire Punch or Chainsaw Man, but what they lack in length, they more than make up for in passion and quality. 
Both theories deal with loss, specifically loss through the passing of a loved one, and how artistry allows the protagonist to cope with that loss. It's honestly not a theme or concept that I haven't come across before in fiction, but he handles it with such grace and elegance while grounding it with a brand of vulgarity and eccentricity that you can only really find within manga that he creates. Jokes are ever present in both Look Back and Goodbye Airy, but never once did I feel that they took from the sincerity of the moment at hand. Rather, they stand to be a stamp on the work affirming that it is truly his. Based on how powerfully both manga resonate, I would say that Fujimoto is someone who copes and has coped with many different difficulties in his life through the creating of art, through creating manga. This is something that he himself has said quite explicitly when prompted to explain why he wrote an illustrated look back, but one cursory read of the manga and you'd be able to discern that with ease. The same is true for Goodbye Airy, although this morning is done through the medium of film rather than manga. Of the two, Goodbye Airy is my favorite. The slightly longer runtime allows you to grow more attached to the characters, and the unique first-person perspective from which we consume the story for a majority of the runtime really immerses you in the world the way the in-universe audience is immersed. The meta nature of it is honestly really cool to pick up on as you continue reading, and this distinctive style of presentation will always make it stand out even amongst Fujimoto's works. As you continue to flip the pages of this manga, you continue to be inundated with new twists on information that we had prior that brings the entire point of the story into focus. In less than 200 pages, Fujimoto subverts expectations or recontextualizes information we had taken for granted several times, all with subtle tweaks or the omission of information early on in the narrative. These twists aren't impressive or important because of what they mean for the story, however. Their significance is strictly due to what it does to the heart of Goodbye Airy. As the manga progresses, you realize that Fujimoto is not simply saying that one can or should cope with loss through film, but that art can allow you to remember someone in any way you see fit. In fact, I think this message transcends film or even art at large and is a commentary on how it is up to you to remember loved ones how you so choose. No one is perfect. No one will have only shown you their good side. No one gets to choose how they are remembered after they pass. But as the person left behind, you are. Will you remember them for all their faults? Or will you choose to recall the special moments, the quiet moments, the moments of time that you took for granted but would now do anything to get back? In Goodbye Airy, it's obvious what Fujimoto believes in regards to this matter. And an artist has the unique ability to push that interpretation onto their audience. They have the power to not only remember you fondly, but make sure that the world at large does too. That's extremely powerful to me. And ending the one shot how it started with a big fucking explosion is just that icing on the cake. It may be uncouth or unrefined, but when Yuta walks away with the abandoned building blowing up in the background, it feels like Fujimoto acknowledging and embracing that side of his art for all to see. Look Back does something similar, although the messaging is a bit less personally touching to me. In exchange, as a special favor to me specifically, cause me and Fujimoto cool like that, he decided to put the best art he's ever made in this manga, threatening to almost reach out and touch my heart with its beauty. The manga focuses on two young girls connecting and finding friendship in one another through art. And when one is killed in a tragic attack, how that connection built on drawing manga allows them to continue moving forward. These two manga, no, the individual one-shot archetype at large makes me understand exactly why I love this medium so much. Many of my favorite pieces of fiction are serialized manga, and they will continue to be till the end of time, but I've never gotten such a condensed understanding of why I love manga holistically so much more than when I spent time recently reading these one shots. I hope I was able to explain why throughout the course of this video. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next one. And hold on, hold on. I can't forget this.